Those who have never been before, generally what happens is I give a brief presentation, maybe speak to some of the highlights and challenges um, that's going on in our district, and then I turn it over uh, for open question response. Uh, my commitment to you is to try to answer every question uh, that I can to the best of my ability. I ask uh, respectfully that if I don't know the answer, we just generally say we're not sure or let us try to figure that out. And we generally put up an FAQ to try to answer that question because a lot of times if we hear the same questions over and over, um, it may not be just you but others who need that response as well. Um, and in some cases, I will have some of my administrative team maybe uh, answer some of the questions if there's more detail that they're probably a little bit more adept to answer than myself. So with that being stated, I'm going to go ahead and start with our presentation, try to get through this part as fast as possible, and then leave as much time within the hour for our open uh, question response dialogue. Um, so. One of the things I want to start out with is just general points of pride uh, within our school district. Uh, this year, we saw an increase again in our graduation rate. So this year's graduation rate was 96.3. You always strive for 100%, but in reality, the national, state, and even our local area um, graduation rates are generally uh, not as high as what you see in Caledonia. So this is something that we are uh, proud of. Um, it's a phenomenal accomplishment that uh, we've not only done well historically, but we even improved on past performance. In addition to that, it's not just getting kids across the finish line, but getting them across well so that they're prepared for whatever they endeavor to do after the high school experience or the general K-12 experience. So as you can see, we had 59 students, or about 16% of our graduating class, which was about 374 students this year, who uh, received a 4.0 or higher. Uh, in order to do that, you have to have at least one or more AP courses. Um, and on top of that, many of these students not only were achieving at a high level, but they were also not just studying, 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 but they were involved in sports, various clubs. And so that's what we like to see, uh, well-rounded students um, who are academically prepared for the rigors of whatever life brings after uh, they finish with uh, Caledonia. And what's even more impressive, which you won't see in many districts, is 81% of our kids are planning to pursue uh, some form of continuing education. Uh, for a small portion, that means going directly into the armed services. But for many of them, that is going to a specific um, uh, trade program, a two- or a four-year university. And our students compete um, very well with other students across the state for some of the most prestigious universities within our state and within our country. So we feel very good about what we're able to do. And what we routinely have seen, um, and, and from our preliminary data with NWEA, as well as our state assessment scores, we consistently score um, near the top within our region. There is some room for improvement, so we're constantly striving to look to get better. But I think what I wanted to bring up, uh, across is um, Caledonia, the quality of education that our kids have received um, and uh, traditionally is great. And in the last couple years, it's even better. And so we want to keep trying to build on that success. A couple things I want to highlight, uh, a lot of construction going on, about $15 million worth of construction going on this summer. So it is a condensed, fast-paced summer that has a lot of moving parts. Um, construction will be completed at Duncan Lake Middle School on schedule. There will be some um, things that we'll need to continue to work on as we start the first couple weeks of the school year. But by and large, um, students and staff will be able to be in the buildings without impact. This work will be going on behind the scenes and after hours. Uh, we're asking families as much as possible to stay out of the buildings, um, stay off certain areas of the grounds until the construction is complete. One, we want to get quality and craftsmanship of the work, 
Um, and two, we want to make sure that everyone is safe. And three, um, we don't want things to, to happen that would impede uh, the progress that we're making to get schools ready uh, to start. At Duncan Lake, there will be a new main entrance completed in September. Uh, staff and students will still have access to the building, so I'm going to show a few quick pictures. That new front entrance, this is going to be on what is now uh, considered the back side of the building or where Scotland Yards is, the big parking lot. Um, but this will be the new entryway for the students that will take them directly to the office area. Um, in this area over here, you see this is kind of a hallway uh, with six different classrooms. This was what was formerly known as our media center or what we think of as the library. That has been reconfigured, six different uh, science classrooms. So it's being outfitted with the appropriate plumbing and everything for a traditional uh, science classroom. This space over here is part of what used to be um, actually these two, or these three, is part of what used to be um, the old boys and girls locker room off uh, the auxiliary gym. So remember in Duncan Lake at one point was a, a traditional high school. We had two gyms and uh, correspondingly two locker rooms. This is all being reconfigured to be the new um, library media center. Uh, designed to be very student friendly, um, allows for some collaborative work and learning space for the students and the teachers. Um, furniture that's designed to be flexible and movable so that um, it can blend itself to the type of uh, learning space that um, is more modern and seen in a lot of our newer schools. So significant work will be directly across from the current cafeteria. Um, for those who, you, you will see a lot of these full presentations, they're already on our website. And if you ever have a question um, that you think about later, there is a link where you can send your question directly to uh, those who lead the bond team and they will respond uh, with the answer. Um, whether it's a district staff members on, who's on the bond team or the architects and the uh, lead construction uh, manager who's over these projects. But I'm just taking pieces of some of these presentations. This was traditionally the parent pick up and drop off. This is along Duncan. Now this will be the bus pick up and drop off area. And we move the parent pick up and drop off area along the back side of the building. So this was that new uh, area that you saw that will be the new entryway. Um, if you're just looking at the space here, one of the big changes to flipping this around is we can't change the location of our schools. And as our community have grown, traffic is just a challenge. But by making pick up and drop off here, we're able to get more than double the number of cars in and off the streets, which we are hoping to try to improve on the bottleneck that, be, that goes down uh, Johnston and down Duncan Lake both ways, and also just make this a safer environment. This first year, it, it will not occur, but eventually um, there will be a widening in, of this area for a specific left-hand turn lane, and eventually there's going to be a left-hand turn lane up here because our community center will be over to this way. So. Um, over the next couple years, our goal is not to just make these changes, but look for the little ways that we can control, because we cannot reconfigure the roads. We don't have the funding, and it's not legally allowed with school district bond funds, but we're trying to think forward into how we can ease the traffic burden, uh, given the number of families and students and buses that are coming through during these times. Craft Middle School, quick overview, these classrooms will be ready to go at the start of the school year. Uh, the one big addition is we're doubling the size of the cafeteria, uh, given the number of students that will be there. Um, our current cafeteria is not sufficient. Our problem, a lot of that rain that hit, it kind of halted construction and it has put the team behind. We started um, shortly after spring break working on the building. Um, we are anticipating that uh, the new addition to the cafeteria will be completed 
uh, sometime in September. Right now, the uh, administrative team is making like alternative plans to uh, get the kids in and out for the cafeteria and for lunch appropriately during the first couple weeks of school while they're still working on the second part. But the traditional uh, cafeteria area will be open um, as always and ready. Um, the, uh, the additional side, which will double the capacity, that part will still be under construction, but it will be done in a way where the students are not at harm during the day. So here's just kind of an example of the work that's going there. So here's the newer portion of the building with uh, exit emergency doors. Um, it's kind of hard to tell here, but you can see this wall here um, on the other side of that green uh, machine there is the existing cafeteria. All of this area that you see here um, is the new addition to the cafeteria. Uh, here's an example of one of our uh, classrooms that's being added. There's going to be about four classrooms added to this facility. Right now, it's not a problem because we can house all the kids um, without these four classrooms. However, um, we were looking at the probability based on uh, housing pattern growth changes that we've seen in the last decade plus in our community. Um, having this seven, eight, uh, five, six, seven, eight structure and making sure that each facility is large enough to house an additional capacity. So our thinking was the only real thing that need to be added here is four additional classes, uh, which is small in the grand schemes of things. Most of the work is going on at Duncan Lake. And um, the, you can see from the outside, there's a lot of changes going on to the parking lot to help the traffic flow better. So looking at that, changing um, the pick up and drop off area uh, to being here is gonna be a roundabout here to make the traffic flow a little bit smoother and the buses go in uh, where these purple arrows are. So looking at making these changes, uh, I've been told that it gets almost three times the number of cars in and out, or at least off craft. The challenge is you got to get back on craft at some point, so how do we deal with that? Um, the first year, our schools, secondary, uh, our middle schools and our high schools, they started within five minutes of each other. Now there's about a 15-minute uh, change, and so we had to make these incrementally um, because even though five minutes or 15 minutes doesn't sound like a lot, in the transportation world and the logistics of that for a couple thousand students that you're busing is significant. But uh, the goal is to have a little bit of a staggered start and release to allow uh, more cars to get in and out of craft before the high school traffic come. There's always gonna be some parents who come early. There's always gonna be some students who come early. Um, but just given more time between the start and end of Kraft and Duncan and the high school generally seems to help with the traffic flow. So we're doing that in addition to the parking lot changes. Um, Kettle Lake and Caledonia, um, yeah, Kettle Lake and Caledonia Elementary. Um, most of the work um, is almost completed. Classrooms will be ready to go. These two buildings are getting, the, the biggest piece that they're getting is um, air conditioning uh, in those buildings. Uh, so that will be um, significantly helpful for the students and staff in those facilities. There are some uh, things that they're doing with the electrical capacity and the technology work behind the scenes that deal with uh, speaker intercom systems and some other work to become um, in the future in the bond. But for right now, the big focus is the air conditioning. So every single classroom is getting a uh, brand new air conditioning unit um, that did not exist before. So just some of the pictures, uh, you can see this big unit here. Um, it looks like an oversized refrigerator when you walk in there. And, you know, part of the question is like, every classroom is getting one of those? Back in the old days, uh, you had these registered vents that ran along the whole length of it. And so believe it or not, while that is 
a big piece in terms of the actual square footage and space it takes up. It takes up less space. And if we have a unit that needs to be replaced, it doesn't take out an entire section of a building or the entire building in terms of air conditioning, heating, and cooling. It, it is an individual unit. So we looked at it in terms of its efficiency and cost effectiveness. Um, and this is kind of for buildings that are this old and being retrofitted, this is um, more cost efficient and effective um, uh, in the short and in the long term. And then you can see some of the behind the scenes technology and electrical work that's going uh, because now is the time to do it, even though some of the additional work will come in a year or two down the road. So just another example of some of the work that's going outside to get these air conditioning uh, units ready to go. Um, paving, that is going on in a lot of places throughout our district. So even coming here tonight, you've kind of noticed we've done uh, repaving in the high school parking lots that, that's needed. That's also happening at the Maintenance and Transportation Center. It's also happening, I believe, in Emmons Lake. Um, a little bit at uh, Kettle and Cal L, and I'm not sure if there's any other big paving projects. Duncan Lake is the other one. So a lot of, uh, lot of asphalt and concrete going down this summer. So again, just some, this is Cal L actually. Here's uh, the maintenance transportation center. Um, you can see it's all dirt now that has all been stripped and uh, asphalt and concrete is going in. Um, this is at the high school. Um, the construction of the Caledonia Athletic Complex. Um, one of the things I forgot to add, at some point we're going to have to figure out an actual name for Calplex or this new center. So we'll probably have some type of um, opportunity or contest to figure out what we're going to name that coming in the fall. We do plan for a groundbreaking ceremony. More information will be coming in the future on this. Um, but this project is currently out to bid. We kind of have a design. Now we, uh, the architects are finished with that work. We want to see what the bid specs come out looking like. Um, the projected completion of this, and Sarah, help me. Are we thinking January of 23? Yes. January, February of uh, 2023 is when this project is expected to be completed. So here's just some outside uh, visuals of it, um, a, a daytime shot and a nighttime shot. Um, if you want to see the full presentation, again, that is on our website. Um, and you can kind of see some of the uh, inside conceptual drawings um, of what the layout for this will look like. This will be um, our current uh, community resource center will be relocated in this facility. Um, we don't have a home for our high school uh, swim team. This will be the new home for our high school swim team. Uh, when our high school swim team is not using it, um, then this will be space that can be programmed and used for the YMCA and a host of other um, activities there. So, um, and then the new Dudden Elementary. Um, that's right now currently in the design phase. The projected opening for this new building is the fall of 2024. Um, if you're wondering where that location is, the current Dudden is right here on 68. So if you come down 68, uh, hang a right, go down Patterson. Um, on 76 in Patterson, all of this is the new land location for this facility. Um, so it's about, according to this, just literally a, a mile and a half away, or depending on your driving, uh, about two miles away from its current location. It's a 53-acre site. Um, we don't quite need 53 acres for an elementary, so we'll have to figure out what to do with that, but it is more than sufficient for what we need right now. This current site is really under uh, size for a traditional elementary in terms of the physical building, the parking lot space, and uh, adequate playground space for the kids. Uh, so this will be a significant improvement, and given 
Um, when you look at this on an aerial map, so there's an older presentation, it, what looks kind of odd is you have this building, you have about four homes, um, but everything around Dudden is labeled as uh, light industrial or commercial sites. So new Amazon is uh, right down the street right here. It's just not the ideal spot for an elementary school. So here is kind of some um, architectural renderings that's still in the early phase, so we don't know what the final uh, design will look like, but we're thinking that the building shape will look something like this. Off 76, there will be an entryway. Off Patterson, there will be an entryway, possibly another one here. You can see some uh, play fields over here, um, playground area for the students. Um, this is kind of, will probably be preserved as some natural uh, habitat space, maybe looking something like this. Again, this is not final. These are representative images. Um, you can see kind of playground space, something looking like that with ability for um, uh, space for, for students to walk around. So students who are in a wheelchair, what have you, having access accessibility to the playground. So that's just kind of the overall design. Probably will have an area for pick up and drop off similar to something like this. But again, on the corner of 76 and Patterson. Administrative building. Um, in order to make adequate space for the 7-8 facility and then for some future work um, for the early childhood center in terms of spacing, um, the administration uh, will be moved over into the old Glenmore site. Um, so that construction is almost complete. We anticipate the staff moving into that space sometime in September after the school year is underway. Uh, and we are shooting for an October um, open house uh, that will probably uh, be adjacent uh, to the October board meeting. So just some uh, quick pictures here. Um, here is the traditional uh, entryway into Glenmore, and then it ends right there. So all of this space over here represents uh, new space. Uh, inside, this is kind of a reconstruction of the new space. So in here is where the central office will be. Maybe on the other side of this will be the new boardroom. So we're kind of moving central office operations out of its current location um, in this facility, it's really like a large house. It will double in size and become the new administration building. So again, without going into all the details of that, more bond information if you're interested, uh, just there's a tab on the front site, bond web, uh, visit bond page 2020. Um, and if you have any questions at any time, just click that, send an email. It goes to several people on the bond team uh, they'll probably have the answer with much more detail than what you would probably even care to know. Um, and you can get your questions answered. Uh, the other thing, before um, we, next school year, we are trying to really look at the landslide of information that is out there. But some of the things that's pretty evident right now is uh, in regards to mask and facial coverings. Um, right now, um, this is completely a choice of um, the parents and the families. Um, we are very aware that CDC, uh, American Pediatrics Association, and several other healthcare agencies are encouraging and recommending that people consider wearing masks indoors. Um, and so, we are encouraging and recommending people consider wearing masks indoor, but do understand that it is everyone's individual right, and we will respect that regardless, whichever way they want to go. Um, playground zones for elementaries will no longer be enforced. This is one of the mitigation strategies that were recommended uh, previously, um, so that if you did have a case of COVID to try to limit or slow down the spread and be able to identify if and when kids had to be put in quarantine as close contacts, that is no longer being enforced, allowing kids in classrooms to move freely um, in their grade levels. 
Schools will not be requiring uh, or quarantining students. Um, that is something that uh, continues to be the case uh, that will be uh, through the Kent County Healthcare Department. It is not something that school districts are required to do. So at this point, now I'm gonna turn it over for open questions and answers. Uh, and so again, um, just so that everyone can hear equally, uh, we ask that if you have a question, um, please use one of the two microphones over here and we will do our best to answer. After tonight's presentation, the FAQ document that you picked up when you came in, this will be shared with all of our families and put on our website. All right, open for questions and answers. And I, if I left you speechless, we can all go home early. And just, I, I see we have a young lady heading up to the uh, microphone, but just in general, uh, when school gets started, we'll probably get back to our normal um, um, dialogue with doc session. So generally what I try to do this is three times a year, and I try to do one in the a.m. for the breakfast crowd. I try to do one in the middle of the day for the lunch crowd, and then one in the evenings. And generally it's the same fashion. Um, I kind of give the good, the bad, the ugly, and then whatever questions you have. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for calling me young. <laughs> <clears throat> and thank you for the work that you do. Thank you. Um, so my eight, soon to be eighth grader and his buddies were telling me yesterday, <laughs> this is how I get information <laughs> from these kids, right? They were telling me that the um, craft build, no, the Duncan Lake building will now be on the same hourly schedule like the high school in the sense that they won't have focused teachers. I just haven't heard anything about this. I don't have a feeling either way. I was just looking for more information. Yes, yeah, so um, they will not be on the same hourly schedule, but there will be some closeness in the scheduling. And we do that, and we have done that historically for a number of reasons. One, um, Sometimes uh, for staffing and funding reasons, we share staff between buildings. And so they're not exactly the same starting in time to allow, allow staff for some driving time. The other thing we were thinking is moving downstream. We're working towards um, um, enhanced learning opportunities for our academically accelerated kids. And sometimes eighth graders might be able to take advantage of some things in some unique ways. So. It is not a mirror for mirror thing. There are some things that we are trying to do that is similar uh, from a seventh, eighth grade perspective, getting them ready going to the high school. But, but some of the scheduling is a matter of transportation, it's a matter of staffing, it's a matter of what we can offer for kids. Um, so it is not exactly a mirror image, but there are some similarities, yes. Great question. Other questions? Yes. Evening. Sorry, I'm a shorty. So maybe I missed this, and I'm sorry if you already said it, but what is the plan for the old Dutton Elementary building? So great question. So if you didn't hear, what is the plan for the old Dutton Elementary? And right now, we don't have a definitive plan. That is something that uh, we have a bond team as well as uh, board members and a subcommittee who will help us look at the best usage. Uh, and so we have had some um, professionals take a look at that in terms of um, do we sell it? Do we keep it for future use? Do you try to redevelop it? Um, if you try to sell it, do you sell it um, as is? Do you... Um, raz the building or, or basically take it down and sell it more as an industrial site. So there's still a lot of work um, to go into that, but knowing that the school won't be ready until the fall of 2024, um, it's probably going to be at least a year, year and a half before we really start getting into those details. Great question though. Other questions or Yes. I have a question. My daughter will be going to Duncan this year, and we live down off of 100th Street. Is there any plan for like a school zone for the parent drop-off where we'll be turning off of Craft? Because that area is 55, 
and I just worry about like pulling out and people getting hit in that area. I didn't know if that had been considered. Off of? Off of Craft. Where the parent drop off will come in off of Duncan. That's a 55. Yeah, you know what? If some one of my team members can write that down, do you know the answer to that? I don't. Uh, okay. I believe they're going to be having flashing lights um, similar further down where the high school is during the start and end times of school where that will reduce the speed of traffic at, at that location. So I believe that's the plan. I do know that there was some discussion about crosswalks and speed bumps, which I don't think is going to work uh, on craft. Um, so I, I think that is still evolving, and I'm glad you were here. Um, I, I don't know exactly where that ended, but I, I think it probably will be some type of lights warning people, like during certain times, slow your roll. Mm -hmm. Great question. Other, yes, sir. Hey, Dr. Martin, how are you? I'm um, great. I have a question as it relates to the community center. When, when will we know the public's capability of using that? I know it's a partnership with the YMCA. When are we going to have more details as to membership rates, availability of, of time for the general public to use it, uh, students to use it outside of a school function just to work out and, and those type of things? Great question. So I'm going to say that um, I anticipate it'll probably be a year out given when we're going to start this. They're going to have to do a little bit of a pro forma. Um, so they're already kind of looking at that. But as we get into the construction and see the actual construction cost and, and, and have better estimates of what it's going to take from a utility perspective, that will give the YMCA a better glimpse of what that's going to look like. Right now, we are in the uh, contract development phase. So conceptually, we have already reached an agreement of how this works, at least uh, for the district's side financially. Um, but it's going to take a little while for the YMCA to look at the pro forma to figure out how they're going to make it work financially. So my guess and it's a complete yes, is we're probably about a year out before they're able to start rolling out some of that information. But the contract is kind of underway, um, and they know that we're trying to keep it as affordable as possible for the community. Um, so that is something that is in their bailiwick, but we're just not there yet. Yep, great question. Yes, ma'am. My name is Carrie, and I just wanted to say I'm a daughter of an incoming fifth and seventh grader this year, and also a nurse at uh, one of our Grand Rapids hospitals who is taking care of COVID patients this whole pandemic. Um, in regards to the new policy with the masking, and I should say no masking, and no real social distancing, anything like that, um, I guess it's clear that we're not doing much this year to protect our kids like we did last year, which I was so thankful for, all of the measures we put into place last year to keep our kids safe in like the worst year ever possible. So in regards to it this year, I know things are a little different, but with cases already going up in all 50 states, I'm just kind of wondering if things escalate more, what are our plans to keep our kids safe as far as issuing those again, will we just go along, will we go along with what the county or state, will we throw mask orders back on to keep our kids safe? Great question. Um, and so I think as we get closer and closer to the start of the year, I'm hoping things will firm up even more um, in terms of what is going to be recommended and what's going to be required. So a couple weeks ago, we put out stuff because what we got from the state and the local health department is that um, it's no longer required, it's recommended, and at the time that came out, things were going in the right direction, and people were going out to get more vaccination, so I think it was more optimism. Mm -hmm. Just in that short time, which was about two and a half, three weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, we're already starting to see um, people like uh, the, 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 
the, the CDC and the, the um, various healthcare agencies going, doubling down to say we really encourage people to either get a vaccine or to get um, to consider wearing masks. So right now, under our current um, regulations or recommendations guidance, um, it is not a requirement. If it becomes a requirement, um, then we will be going back to speak to our community, our staff, and let them know. Uh, we are encouraging people, or I, I will say encourage people, um, you know, let's be smart about it. If you're not feeling well, um, please stay away so that you don't harm others, even though you might be fine. Um, not everybody has the same situation, and we see that this affects people differently, and we want to be respectful to whatever their decision is. Um, but right now, it would really be speculative and a guess on my part. I, I really struggle to, to see that they're going to make it mandatory based on just some of the pushback that you're seeing all across the country. But if they make it mandatory, then we're going to have to revisit that just like any other public school and we'd have to make that decision accordingly, and we would communicate that out to our families as soon as we had the information and had clear understanding. Okay, thank you. Yep, thank you. Yeah, um, Hi. I have a question also following up to the mask. If it does become required and Caledonia does enforce it, um, and a large number of parents decide to pull their kids from the school, how long does it take to get things switched over to like um, just like a virtual non Caledonia associated uh, school system? Like, is that pretty? I've never done it before, and I'm just curious as to how that would be. Yeah, so, so I mean, a parent can at any point um, switch to an online learning platform that's not operated by Caledonia. That, um, you know, when you look at the number of kids that come and go in our system, like weekly, you, I think people would be amazed. It is not uncommon for us to have every year. So, if, if, I mean, because there'll probably honestly be like a sudden mass exodus <laughs> if you if we do go that route, um, according to what other parents are saying. So, I'm just wondering, like, downtime is it going to be? You think a couple weeks, or is it hard to predict what that's going to be like on your end to get the information out to the new program? like transcripts and things like that, or that is pretty, oh, pretty seamless? So generally it takes a couple weeks and it depends on what type of new program. So if you're transferring to a new school system, uh, generally um, it takes a couple weeks, but it doesn't prohibit the kid from transferring the very next day. But now, if you're talking about a new school system within the Kent County, we all operate, there's a state schools of choice system there's a Kent County Schools of Choice system. In both cases, there are very defined windows of when kids can transfer. Um, if you move, it's immediate. If you are going through Schools of Choice transfer, then it's limited whether it's the mask mandate or whatever happens. Um, if you go to a private school or you homeschool, that can happen immediately. There are some um, programs that um, People do homeschooling, and it's an online educational program. That can happen immediately. Um, generally, those programs don't ask for transcripts. Um, it will be your public schools that ask for transcripts. Generally, your private schools don't ask for it either, but it, it takes a few weeks before that paperwork comes through, but it doesn't take that long for a family or a kid to move into a new school system, provided that school system is accepting those kids. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I just kind of want to piggyback on what she was asking. If we do go to a mask mandate, does Caledonia have any plans to open up the like online academy to allow students to kind of pivot in the middle of those things so that we're not required to mask our children if we don't feel that that's necessary? Not this year, no. Um, one of the things that we saw and, and, and we just didn't feel good about, we tried to encourage people for staffing, for curricular, for a lot of reasons. You know, if you want to come face to face, please come face to face, but understand we have to follow what state requirements are. Um, and if that means going into masks, great. But if you're going to switch to online, 
the cadence, the pace, and what you're doing, it is so significantly different. One, it's really not good for the kids. Two, it really is hard on the teachers. And, and our teachers were in a tough spot trying to educate kids in front of them and then do the kids online because they didn't get the additional time to do that in the appropriate way. So we're not doing that. It will be right now, and I will say this with a caveat. In a couple weeks, as th things start to solidify, we'll probably start to solidify in exactly what this looks like. But Right now, I would probably see it very similar to when COVID first happened. It's either all or nothing, like a whole school might have to go online. And so we, we only had that happen in one of our elementaries because we saw a huge spike that was moving really fast this year. Uh, we saw it at our high school, um, which you know, unfortunately that happened a couple times. Um, but if we saw a huge spike in an individual building or if the state said, or the, the county health department said, in this building or in this area, you had a significant concern. We would have to move accordingly, and it will probably be all students. But an individualized program where kids are flipping back and forth, probably not going to happen because what we were doing is we were sawing a, a lot more kids falling through the cracks and just doing things that didn't lead to good education. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any. There is an option at the semester point to be able to go from online to face-to-face -to -face or face-to-face -to, -face to online, so at the semester break. I knew it was something I was forgetting, so thank you. <laughs> yes. Hi. Uh, first, thank you for um, fixing the craft drop-off and pick-up. From experience, that was a hot mess. Um, <laughs> yeah. Anyways, I was kind of just wondering, what actually happens if you don't follow the recommendations of the health department to a T? What if you decide that we do actually have the right to make these decisions for our kids and you keep that power with the parents? What happens to the district if you do that? So, great question. Um, basically, can you not follow the recommendations or the requirements of a local health uh, department or a state. So if it is a recommendation, it is just that, it's a recommendation. If it is a requirement um, and we decided not to follow, um, the state um, or the local health department could take legal action to either A, shut us down, um, if the state were to support them in that, the state could take action, and it could be a range of things that could be sanctioned to, you know, schools in terms of funding. And I know some people is like, well, just tell them whatever. Well, in reality, if, if funding stopped flowing to schools, um, we have about six weeks' worth of money to keep us going. So at some point, this becomes a decision that, we don't have funding to keep our doors open. Um, now, that's, that's like the most extreme, but think of it like this. If, the, if an inspector came in and said there's a serious E. coli issue in this restaurant, and this restaurant refused to comply, they would have the right to shut them down. That would be the same thing if they felt that this was a serious, justifiable health emergency that put people at risk in the school district refused to comply. In addition to that, and we've checked with our insurance carrier as well as our attorney, you also would have some litigation that could send this district backwards in a sense that if I have a, if I have a state or a uh, local agency that is given that authority, and I intentionally say, I'm not gonna do it, I don't believe it, and we're going to take our chances, and I have one student or one staff member who gets gravely ill, we would lose our governmental immunity, i.e., our insurance is not going to pick up that bill for that lawsuit, and we would have to answer, under what authority did you make that choice that put this child or this family member, regardless of how I personally feel, at risk to the point where it had a significant negative impact that could 
you know, and in the worst case scenario. So at that point, this is not your insurance will pick up the bill. They're very clear. No, you acted on your own. And however many zeros are behind that, you need to pick that bill up. Um, and that could be devastating to a school district. Um, I would imagine um, that that would be an extreme worst case scenario. But that is a possibility. Okay, and so then just a, a follow up, because I, I do understand that answer, but what if you have us all sign on the dotted line, right? Like, how come we can't be waived from that recommendation? What if you had the parents who, who want to keep the right to choose for their children sign a waiver that were to say, if my child does end up sick, I will not sue the school? Question, that question was actually asked um, by a superintendent months ago, and I think what I heard from the attorney or from that superintendent, that that wouldn't be sufficient because of the nature of what we're talking about, um, that that probably wouldn't hold water. Um, so something similar that, that um, we sometimes see um, happen. You know, a parent says, you know, if something happened and this teacher is transporting my child from A to B, um, don't worry, I won't sue or whatever. But in the worst case scenario, that actually happened and there was a school district, I think, northern Michigan, where that applied. The parent had the right to change their mind and file a, file a lawsuit against the district because that didn't quite hold up in the court. So I think we would probably be in that similar situation because you're talking about an airborne situation um, and we just don't know the impact of it. So I will say this, I'm not the legal expert, but I did hear that question posed from another superintendent and the response that he shared with us that he got from his law firm is that uh, they would not advise that that would be uh, what the district should do. Okay. But a great question though. Thank you. Uh-huh. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. I have a couple questions. Um, the first one, for the social and emotional learning, will there be an option for us to opt out like the reproductive health? Yes, that has been uh, since I was in school. Um, sex education is always an option for parents to opt out. That has not changed. But for the social and emotional learning? So I think, um, and, and this is where Kristen and Josh can help me, but if there is any particular area of the curriculum that a parent feels um, is inappropriate, they can exercise the option. First, we would say, have a conversation with the teacher. Uh, in most cases, we ask the teachers to provide an alternative assignment for situations like that. So we see this a lot, um, let's say, if it is in literature. Sometimes there are some of our great American novels have some content in it that people feel is maybe inappropriate for their child for religious reasons or what have you. Um, Kids and parents can then always work with the teacher to find an alternative assignment um, or an alternative something to do, uh, or if you will, opt out. Okay. Um, also, I, how about the curriculum? I know that it mentions on here that the syllabus and others are going to be, a, but what about the actual materials and books that are used? Maybe not necessarily them completely scanned and laid out for us, but maybe listed? So typically we see that at the high school level, like colleges, where uh, teachers have a syllabus of like what's to come and what materials to use. At the elementary level, um, that would be a massive list. So I would say you might want to talk with the teacher uh, in the sense like, so I'll give an example. We do what we call, uh, or a lot of schools do like, guided reading, you might hear level reading or something like that. You might have a list of several different books, and in some cases, kids can make choices of what that is. So the fluidity of that is kind of different. The standards are always available for parents to review. The, the actual instructional materials that teachers use, uh, because they don't have that laid out like day one, day 37, day 19, day 400, this is what I'm going to use, um, 
there has to be some conversation with the teachers. So I would say if you ever felt like you wanted to know what's coming, some teachers do a good job in newsletters because in a lot of cases they work as a team to say, here's what we're working on this month. We'll be covering the topics of this, this, and this. Um, and if you see something that sends a question mark, first thing I would do is have a conversation with the teacher, uh, see what that is. And there may be a few cases, but for the most part, teachers are pretty free at saying, oh, yeah, this is what we're going to use. If you want to take a look at it, we're fine with that. Will we be allowed in the schools this year to see what's on the walls and on the doors uh, of the classrooms as well as meet the teachers and go to classroom parties regardless of what happens with COVID? Um, I, you know, that's a good question that I think we're going to have to um, be able to identify a little bit later. If things uh, flare up pretty bad as it relates to COVID, um, we may be in, if you're allowed in, but you must wear a mask. Or, or you know, like there's always going to be open house or other times where people are able to come in. Um, and so coming in to see what's in your child's classroom, that shouldn't be a problem. If you're talking about going to every classroom and taking inventory, that's not something that we generally do or, that's or something that's, that's allowable. Um, we don't try to prohibit parents coming in. Uh, but one thing that I'm going to be pretty consistent with is we want to respect the instructional integrity of what's going on in the classroom. So if parents come in, it's been a long time since I've been a building principal, but we try to have it during certain times where they're not going to interrupt the classroom lesson, whatever that is. Um, but whether it's an open house, whether it's parent-teacher conference, we don't lock off the ability for parents to come in. Um, but it won't be, I'm a parent in classroom B, and I'm going to go check out every single classroom and see what they got. No. Okay. My last question to you is um, what we kind of discussed on Monday night in regards to the, um, the thing that's on the door of, I guess, a teacher's classroom where it says that this is a safe zone for the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. Why can't the school be safe for all mankind and not be causing division. It should be safe for all students, not just for those who choose to be that way. You know, I, I think that's something that I'm going to have to look into because I went looking for that sign. It happened to be on a door that's not an actual classroom or not a teacher, um, but we identified who that individual is who uh, may have put that on that door. Um, but I, I want to be clear, like we want to make sure that all students are safe, all students are treated with kindness, dignity, and respect. So you hear me say that a lot. Um, I think some of the evidence that we've seen um, is pointing that some of the kids that are most at risk are, are, or feel most marginalized is some kids who struggle with gender identity issues, and they may identify as uh, um, gay, homosexual, whatever, whatever, however they identify themselves, however they feel like they want to express themselves, however their family feel it's appropriate for them. Um, those are the kids that um, more often have felt marginalized and report higher incidents of uh, suicide or wanting to attempt suicide. So I can understand why someone may have put that out there to make sure that those kids know that, hey, if you're hurting, if you are feeling unloved, unwelcome, here's a safe place. Come and talk to me about it. That is not put there, or I'm going to assume without talking to the individual, that is not put there as a way to encourage people that this is what you should do. But as a situation, when we talk about SEL and putting certain things in place, uh, that was a direct response to some of the behaviors that we saw, some of the um, situations in this community where several kids had committed suicide and several had attempted suicide. Um, and it, it, it doesn't come in a color or gender or anything else, but, but when you look at some of the national research, you see that there are a certain group of kids that feel a little bit more marginalized and not accepted. So I, I can't speak for why that person put that on the door, 
that's something that I think we're going to have to look to and talk to that particular building and the administration and that individual and figure out what's going on with that. And, and honestly, I've been in districts where there's kid organizations that form and kids have a right to form organizations such as that and they make posters. And, and so there are some very specific laws around that. It's not about how I feel. It's, it's about making sure that everyone is safe, treated with kindness, dignity, respect. If, if there was a student group who chose to place scripture verses in the Lord's Prayer on the wall or on a door, would that be allowed? So if we have a student group, when I was an administrator and a teacher in Texas, who it's a student-led organization that um, get together for a Bible study or in Texas, it was prayer at the pole, there are specific laws that allow that to occur. If this is something that is led by staff, there are very strict um, separation of church and state laws that wouldn't allow us to do that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. That's okay. Did for all of high school for last year, in person and virtual. Yes. Is that going to continue this year, or are we going back to the Caledonia curriculum for the high school? Unless a student is choosing a Michigan virtual course, so for instance, a course that we may not offer. So if we don't offer advanced placement physics and the student wants to take it online, it would be Michigan virtual content or they could take it in the lab, which is available seven hours a day with a Michigan virtual instructor. Otherwise, it will be back with uh, Caledonia curriculum here in the classroom. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah, thanks. And then also, um, our daughter was admitted into the project-based learning program as a freshman. She is now going to be a junior. And so last year, my understanding was that was kind of put on hold for the constraints of the group. Will, sh will the project-based learning program be reinstated in full starting this fall? No, my understanding, and I need to double check with the high school administration, project-based learning is kind of being uh, folded into kind of our career pathways. Um, and so um, I don't think that that's going to be a standalone program, but I need to probably find out. So if we could maybe get her yeah, there will be opportunities for those students that were originally admitted to the program. Um, I can't say it will look the same necessarily, but there will be opportunities to continue project-like approaches with those, uh, with those original students. Um, but the curriculum pathways that was referenced is more of a design thinking approach. So there are similarities between what the incoming high schoolers will, uh, will experience as to what those original project-based learning students experienced. It's just a little bit different philosophy in terms of how we unfold that throughout the high school as opposed to just a small group of students. Thank you. I see I have a couple more questions and I got about two more minutes. So I'm gonna, uh, if you have a quick question, I'm gonna take these two or please head up there and then I wanna kind of be respectful and bring it to a close. Yes, ma'am. My name is Jen. Dr. Martin, I appreciate you having this night in the back and forth and open dialogue. I appreciate that very much. Welcome. Um, I'm a nurse in the com community. I spoke last month at the board meeting, and I do have several concerns going forward. Uh, first and foremost, the masking wording. I understand it's a choice uh, right now, uh, given that the MDHHS is, is saying that as well. And the question was brought up earlier that should that not be an option, it just, the, the masks don't protect against viruses. If you read the box, most of them are made in China. Masks are worn of that nature in surgical settings. They protect against bacteria getting into surgical wounds. So knowing that information and knowing the studies that are coming out about the bacteria that remains trapped in the mass because that's its purpose, and our children rebreathing that in, not ventilating properly, not oxygenating all their tissues, their brains, that all re reduces their ability to learn. 
My concern with the MDHHS being able to change this and us, us sounding like we have to adopt the same stance going forward should they change it, we know that the masks don't work against viral spread. They work against bacterial spread. So why would we, knowing, knowing that, go along with the collective group narrative that, that makes no common sense? Do you personally feel that a mask will pre pre prevent a viral spread? Seeing these scientists in hazmat suits that handle COVID, it, putting a child in a mask and sending them to school and saying this will protect against COVID is the same thing, would be the same reasoning as sending a kid into a nuclear zone and saying, here, put this raincoat on, it's going to protect you. Meanwhile, the scientists are in hazmat suits. So I want to make it clear um, as it relates to this particular matter, my personal opinion is irrelevant. We are a state organization. If the Michigan Department of Health or the Kent County Health Authority or some other authority that's in this case would trump um, a local school district, um, tell us that we must, and it becomes a requirement, we must. Doesn't matter if I like it or not. So I, I don't even want to weigh into my personal opinion. I am an officer of the state in the capacity that every school teacher is. Um, and I'm going to have to be compliant with whatever the requirements is because my first obligation is the safety of all kids. Um, and, and I'm going to have to trust the authority of those who are in that position to make that call. Um, the next thing is I want to keep my doors open um, every possible day that I can uh, for the, the families and the kids that need to be face to face. And so if that means wearing a mask uh, to keep the doors open, then that's what I'm, I'm probably going to do. Um, if it means uh, social distancing or doing things better, if it's reasonable, that's what I'm going to do because I know some families will leave. And it, that's their personal opinion. Uh, some families don't have the ability. They need us to be open. And, and, but this might be the way that I can do it. Um, so I'd have to make that choice. And my personal opinion is irrelevant. So I won't even offer it. What if we were brave? What if we stood up against something that didn't make sense? Wouldn't there be the possibility that other school districts would follow? Being brave and being out of compliance with the law would have me in a situation that uh, for others who feel completely different and need the schools to be open, I think I would be maybe neglectful of the duty of what they need. So again, this is a matter of if we're legally required to do something, we're going to have to do it. So in my role as a nurse, as a pediatric and adult nurse, and being like an air traffic controller, I see the tenfold increase in attempted suicide via ingestion and the, the substantial exponential increase in, in mental illness in our children. It's heartbreaking to have to listen to these stories and be on these phone calls with doctors every day. I can't begin to tell you. And to think that there's no help. Our resources have been depleted. You ask yourself, what has changed for every child in America over the last year? And it's masking, it's social distancing, and it's isolation and this, this fake attempt to say that this is what's going to stop a virus from spreading. The science just doesn't back it up. The masks are for bacterial prevention and not viral spread. My last question is with um, drugs flooding into our border, seeing the increased attempt at suicide with our children via narcotics, opioids, what is the current policy in looking for drugs in the school assessing the increased threat, what policies are in place now, and what would be changed going forward given the exponential increase in, in attempted suicide and presence of narcotics? 
So uh, we are fortunate that we have an active working relationship with the Kent County Sheriff Department where we have a police officer who is assigned to our district um, and work with us when we need to have professional development with our teachers or our staff and even have conversations with students. We are very fortunate that through our um, SEL um, supports, that if we have uh, cases where kids are individually using, we can direct them to our, the right appropriate staff members to help them, and maybe if we need to point them to outside agencies to support that. We do have uh, opportunities for students to um, report information, uh, whether it is someone who has a weapon or have drugs, uh, that they bring in our school in an anonymous fashion that our administration and our officer, if necessary, can take action on. So, unfortunately, um, kids will be kids, and sometimes some of them do things that they shouldn't. Um, we have a very aggressive district policy that certain things are um, just not acceptable, and it could lead to an expulsion. If you're talking about dealing drugs or bringing a weapon, um, there are very few wiggle room with that policy. There are some, but very few. And that should be consistent with most school districts across the state because our policies are aligned with state law. So I think, I feel pretty good that um, I won't say, you know, this is not my first school district. No school district is perfect. They've all had the issues and I've been in some poor and some very wealthy school districts um, where drugs is an issue. But I do feel that we, um, better than a lot of school districts, we have intentionally ramped up our social emotional learning and support and that's part of the process um, and part of the work that they do. I feel pretty comfortable that we have the staff to respond or at least can refer people to appropriate agencies and our policy is pretty sound as it relates to drugs and weapons. What are the, are the agencies that would deal with this? Is that Pine Rest and Forest View? Um, so in some cases, depending on the situation, this might be a windy question. Um, I think we have people who can make referrals to like Pine Rest. Um, what is the other one? Is it Spectrum that we have? A... Our counselors have lists of um, different agencies that are available in um, the area. Um, obviously, if it's an emergency situation, we would call um, 911 and immediately um, work to get that student the assistance that they need. But definitely, our counselors are um, empowered with lists of um, area agencies. In fact, our student support coordinator calls regularly, probably about every six weeks just to find out what availability those counselors have so that we're not recommending um, agencies that are full and not taking uh, new patients. I was just gonna say that they're, they're completely full and there's a waiting list and up to 30 children waiting in our hospital ED at any given time. So thank you. Thank you. Sir, I see you there. I think two ladies were before you, then I'll come to you, and then the lady, if you're there in line, she'll be the last one. Yes. I just had a question. I didn't see anything on here about testing students mm -hmm. for anything. Is that, do you know anything about that, or is that kind of just something that's going to end up? Are we coming? talking about testing for COVID? Yes because all uh, the athletes had testing. There was something with MDHHS, they put out a round table where they were talking about testing unvaccinated students twice a week to yeah. attend school. Yeah, I, I, I heard that? about something that was online and, and I, I think there was a lot of discussion but nothing came out as a mandate that I'm aware of. Um, we do have um, licensed nurse that we added to our staffing last year. Um, if testing is required, um, we can make that something that we are doing, but right now my understanding that not, testing is not required, uh, so there is no plans for it. I have a feeling as the weeks go by, we might get some more information. Um, I'd be surprised if they make that a requirement. In public schools, I can't say what they would do for the athletics. Again, the, the Michigan High School Athletic Association would make that decision, and then we'd 
have to be compliant or not participate. But right now, there's no testing requirements that I'm aware of. Okay, but if MDHHS came down with that and that said that you had to, that would be something that you would then force on the students, like the masks? So, so last year, um, I don't think they required testing for COVID last year. Um, for the athletes, they did? For athletes, but that, yeah. that, that came with MDHSS and the Michigan High School Athletic Association. And so as part of that association, if they said you have to do testing, uh, like wrestling was, you know, twice a week or whatever it was because of the close contact nature. Um, we would have to do it or our kids don't get to participate in wrestling. But that's not something that, like, as a district, we're like, we're going to test. Not requirement and not something we're doing. Okay. But if, if, it, if they come out and say we had to, we would have to act accordingly. I'll have you next. Hi, um, I just had a question with the new school year approaching and um, the mask and vaccines being optional. What does Caledonia administration have in place for students and staff bullying the kids who choose not to? So our bullying uh, <clears throat> practice or procedures, um, we have a policy on it. Um, our schools are pretty used to, sadly, some form of bullying. A lot of times we see it more so in social media. Um, but um, we have policies in place for how to deal with bullying and whether it is bullying a kid because they had a mask or not have a mask. Um, the teachers and the school administration would have to do um, their due diligence investigation and assign discipline accordingly to uh, the policy and the school rules and guidelines. So whether you're bullying somebody because you're physically bigger than them and you're going to take their lunch, or whether you're bullying them about a mask, it, it, bullying is bullying. Does that include teachers who bully the children? You know, I'm not aware of teachers who are bullying children, but I would say that if a teacher or a student is bullying a teacher or a student, it's just inappropriate. And so if a teacher is bullying students, uh, we, would ha we have policies in place and we would have to do our due diligence and investigation and we would have to take appropriate disciplinary action. It's different for obviously staff than it is for kids, but it, it's, you know, we have policies in place for rogue actors, if you will, whether that is a staff member or whether that's a student. Of uh, information would you have to have? Because last year we experienced it with our children and it was brushed under the rug. You know, the, the thing is, it goes down to the investigation that happens. Um, you know, a person can say that they are have been bullied uh, but one, we have to investigate and prove it. Just because I said something doesn't mean that a person is automatically accused, guilty. You have to hear both sides of the issue and look at the, the, the facts of the matter and then determine, is this an incident of bullying or is this something else? Uh, and it could be something else that's inappropriate and then you take the action accordingly. Okay. All right. Yes, sir. Hi, Doc. Bob Sullivan. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank you for your time tonight. And then also on, on Monday. Um, <laughs> you, you stood there and took your lumps on Monday night um, for, geez, an hour, hour and a half. <laughs> um, a lot of topics were covered, and this really isn't so much a question as really more of a statement while you were talking on Monday, you more or less asked for some grace um, with the handout that you've given us. Um, I'm willing to take you at your word with all the topics that we've covered between CRT, masking, uh, the vaccination status stuff, the SEL, all of that. Thank you. Um, 
just know that we're all watching. And I think that's, it, last year was a tough year for everybody. Um, there have been, there's an awful lot of stuff going on um, and it's become so political that it's not even funny. Yes. And I think we, need, we all need to maybe take a little step back and we're, everybody needs to be aware of what's happening also. Thank you very much for that comment. Um, and for those who are not aware, um, Monday was tough. And I, and I did ask for grace in the sense that um, I've, I've heard from teachers who are getting fearful of coming back to teach and, and trying not to get emotional, but that, that, that hurts because I know what our teachers went through. And I can tell you some of our teachers are not happy with some of the requirements some of the changes that they had to make. But I was so proud, we were so proud that we were one of the few districts that opened up on time, full time, for those who wanted to be there and had an option for those who didn't. We had some internal not happy moments as staff with some of the things that we had to do to make it work. Um, but I believe that they did that because they do care. Um, and with that being said, I was asking and still asking for grace and maybe toning down the rhetoric um, because I'm not saying that we're perfect, but I do believe that the majority of the people that come into education is not doing it because they're getting rich. It's because they care. <laughs> and so... Thank you for that. And I just felt like it's reaching a tone and a tenor that doesn't represent what I started out with earlier, the outstanding results that we have produced historically and have improved upon. It doesn't happen by accident. It happened by people busting their butt and caring about kids. I am going to say there's going to be situations where we don't always get it right, but charge it to our head, not our hearts. Hold us accountable. Have the conversation and give us an opportunity to address it or work at it or improve it because we're not perfect. No different than our children. Like, I love my kids, but I know they're not perfect, right? But I don't throw them out or I don't just jump on them if everything that they do is not right, and I'm just like, when you look at the results of what our students and our teachers have been able to do, that's not by circumstance. That's coming from a caring set of people who are busting their butt to put these results up. So, yeah, will I have occasion where we have to take corrective, active, corrective actions with staff members? Yes. And sometimes that is a conversation. Sometimes that is what I call documentable moments. Sometimes it is suspensions or termination. We do that with kids too. But we also give them the benefit of doubt, hear both sides of the story before we jump to a conclusion. And so that is the grace I'm asking for. I'm not saying don't hold us accountable. I'm not saying you can't question us. But just saying that this, I was led to believe, and I do believe, is a caring community. The results show. When we started this whole SEL program, it was nothing but kudos and praise because we were responding to a need in our community that kids were dying or attempting suicide. When we started out the school year, we, our teachers were being poured on with accolades of praise because people were looking at neighboring school districts that were saying, well, we're bringing 50% of the kids back or we're bringing them back a couple days a week. We're going to ease into it. We bust our butt and gave up our summers to figure out how to bring everybody back. So I just hope people remember that spirit that all of a sudden we get to April and we're all tired of the changes, 
I'm tired. I know my teachers are tired. But I don't want to buy into they don't care or there's an active plan to teach or, or sow hatred in our school community. That is not our intent. That is not our heart. So, you know, we'll make some mistakes. Giving us grace is not giving us a pass to do whatever. Ask the question. Hold us accountable. We're, we should be responsive and accountable. Um, but at the same time, I, I don't want people to jump to judge, jury, and executioner. I heard this on whatever platform. Therefore, it must be true, and you must be bad. They must be fired. That's not the community that we want our kids to grow up in because they're watching us. There was a couple things floating around, and then I, I've, I've heard and was shared that the students are now joining on to this. And I'm thinking, how sad is that? That our kids are watching the adults use social media as a bullying platform, and now they're starting to emulate that. And so... Sorry, but I just felt like I, I can't sit and watch that continue without at least saying something. I have one more uh, question. I'm not seeing anything here in regards to, are you requiring your staff to be vaccinated? We haven't. We never have. Again, we encourage people to get vaccinations, but it is a personal choice. We have not um, asked um, our staff to get vaccinated. It is their personal choice. Do you plan to do so in the fall? And if so, those who choose not to get vaccinated, will you segregate them and force them to wear a mask? We have not segregated students or staff based on their vaccination status. We have a right to ask. And the only time we have asked about vaccination status, if the question came down that we had to uh, self-quarantine a teacher or not, and in some cases that made the difference on if a classroom stayed open or if it was shut down. Um, and it is a um, private conversation between that administrator and that staff member but we are not taking scorecards, we, and we are not uh, segregating or separating staff or students based on vaccination status. It is a health decision that people make on an individual basis, and we respect their opinion, and unless it's legally required, which it's not, we haven't done it, we don't plan on Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, with that being said, that is, I'm a little over time, but I hope you found this um, of benefit. Thank you for coming out.